Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is John Wiley uh, from the University of Exeter, and I'm here this morning to, to speak to you about uh, the common line, uh, which hopefully you can read on the screen there. The common line, which is um, an art geography digital project uh, that, that I'm currently uh, working on and involved with. Um, but as you can see, and I, and I do need to start with this point, as you can see, I need to be clear from the outset uh, that I'm kind of just one of um, quite a large group of people. Uh, academics, artists, and uh, technologists who are kind of working together on this project. Um, so this is very much a co-authored piece uh, that I'm presenting to you here this morning, even though it's um, only me actually speaking. And I'm going to say a little bit more in a minute um, about uh, the different roles that different people uh, are playing on this pro in this project. Here's what we're going to do in terms of structure. A uh, pretty straightforward structure. Uh, first of all, we're going to kind of show you the common line, uh, hopefully, if it works, and uh, introduce it and talk about who is involved and what the project uh, is aiming to do. Um, and then after that, I'll move on to a discussion of, firstly, the common line in terms of concepts and theories of landscape, uh, and then secondly, the common line uh, in terms of citizenship, uh, uh, the kind of key topic uh, of this symposium today. And we're going to talk about citizenship uh, in particular in relation to the digital, which is a key component uh, of the work that we're doing. Conclusion, hopefully I'll get to it uh, very quickly at the end. It's a bit more speculative, um, thinking about the common line in terms of disorientations and interactions. So, the common line. The common line is the longest straight line that can be drawn across mainland Britain without crossing any tidal waters, without crossing any sea. This image that you see um, is taken quite near its midpoint uh, up in the Yorkshire Dales uh, in the north of England. The ultimate ambition of the Common Line project uh, that we're working along with a number of partners is to physically realise the Common Line as a line of trees planted at 20 metre intervals across the landscape of Britain. Trees physical and digital. So, let me show it to you. How do I maximise this? This one? Here we go. The common line. So this is the common line stretched across uh, the UK, and if I can zoom in, if I keep zooming in, this will take you all the way to the midpoint of the line that I mentioned up in the Yorkshire Dales. And as you see, as you zoom in, it kind of resolves into a sequence of kind of green dots. So that's what the common line looks like. Um, we ne I need to say something kind of quite quickly about how it is that we determined this, um, because the calculation of the common line was uh, in some ways represented quite a challenge. Um, the determination of this kind of exact trajectory involved firstly acknowledging some parameters and constraints, for example, uh, the curvature of the earth, uh, the topographical variability of the ground, the fact that the ground is not flat, obviously. Uh, equally, the fact that the coastline of Britain, like any coastline, is in practice of infinite length, fractal in nature, uh, alongside the daily and uh, lunar um, fluctuations of the tide. So to kind of address these, kind of pragmatically address these various challenges, a um, colleague working on the project with us, Stephen Palmer, who's a GIS expert, uh, downloaded a shapefile uh, of uh, the outline of Britain from a website called Natural Earth, and then wrote a Python script uh, to convert this coastline shape file, which is a, a Britain that's got approximately 4,000 sides, into a series of nodes and points. The script, the kind of algorithm that Stephen created, then calculated the distance between all of the kind of points on the coastline and identified the pair that are separated by the longest distance without crossing any tidal water. And so we have this kind of resulting approximately 880 kilometres of common line, the longest possible line linking two points on the coastline of, Ma of mainland Britain. And we're confident um, that this determination is robust and would be replicated by anyone using kind of similar cartographic and algorithmic tools. Uh, the common line, if I zoom out quickly, starts, well, where does it start? One starting point is up in the northwest of Scotland, uh, near a hamlet called Mellon Udrigal, 
uh, as the line kind of tracks south southeast from there, crosses through the Scottish Highlands. It runs through the cities of Stirling uh, and Carlisle um, on the English side of the border. Its midpoint, as I said, is up in the Yorkshire Dales and the Howgill Fells. Uh, it passes to the west of Sheffield uh, through the Peak District and goes straight through the centre of a town called Milton Keynes. Um, crosses the Thames uh, down several miles to the west of where we are right now uh, at Teddington Locks, which is the tidal limit of the Thames, and hits the south coast of England uh, at Seaford, just east, sorry, west of Eastbourne. And as you can see, this line articulate, the, the, the kind of visual articulation we have, um, articulates it as a line of approximately 44,000 clock points. Um, and each of those points are potential locations for the planting of trees, living and virtue, through which the kind of proposition of the line uh, will ultimately be realised. And if I... So, that's the common line. I'll say something quickly about the various people who are involved. The concept of the common line uh, was created by Volkart Muller, uh, who's a German artist resident uh, in Exeter. It was Volkart, who I've worked with for several years, who first dreamt up uh, this idea. Uh, Volkart uh, plots in various ways from his studio space in Exeter, a site called Topos. Uh, Volkart's a member of an art group called Blind Ditch, who are partners in this project. And another member of Blind Ditch, uh, Paula Crutchlow, uh, in many ways, the kind of linchpin of the entire project, uh, has been working as a kind of research associate on this project for the past year or so. We also have a kind of um, a partner uh, who calls himself, his name is Chris Hunt, although he trades under the, the uh, name Controlled Frenzy. Uh, he's the uh, digital tech creative technology specialist who has brought this to life uh, via smartphone technologies. And we've been fortunate enough to get some funding to kind of kick this project off from the Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, in particular. Uh, the one person on there that's not on this slide that I should mention is John Drever, uh, who's a, a sound artist and also works at Goldsmiths here in London, who's working with us on this project. So this line, um, we would argue that, you know, I, I present it in this way, I show it to you as a map, as a set of points, but really what it is, we think, or we hope, is a kind of performance or experiencing of landscape through the integration of living and computational ecosystems. Uh, it's a space of encounter, we would argue, wherein citizens can interact with each other and debate the circumstances of landscape, identity and environment as they're mediated and negotiated in Britain today. Uh, our whole kind of practice and ethos of this work is very dialogical, drawing upon the arguments developed in discussions of dialogical aesthetics and socially engaged art practice, uh, noted by Grant um, Kester. At present, we're kind of very much kind of midstream with this work. For the past six months, we've kind of been getting the whole idea off the ground and actually realizing it uh, in this kind of, um, through our kind of website, which I've just showed you, and through some preliminary investigations. Um, the majority of the work we've done so far has actually occurred in, uh, in Carlisle, which is up in the uh, northwest of England uh, in Cumbria. The city is transected by the line, uh, as you can see. And what we've been trying to do is to kind of create and prototype uh, a kind of smartphone-based application. These are screenshots from my own now slightly antique uh, iPhone. Um, so we've been interested in trying to kind of figure out ways in which people can access and interact with and navigate their way um, along and through the line. Uh, we've experimented with different types of kind of digital mapping. Uh, we're not there yet with a kind of app relating to this, although that is our ambition to kind of get to that point at some point in the year ahead. Um, We've designed various types of kind of 3D renditions of trees and tree shapes and tree signs that can be digitally located uh, upon the line using augmented reality technologies. We've talked with and interviewed a whole range of kind of stakeholders uh, and specialists. And we've kind of located and visited the midpoint of the line up in the Yorkshire Dales and staged there a first digital plantation. And that is what you see here. This is a, a augmented reality planted uh, tree. The tree has been drawn by Volkart Muller uh, using a 3D virtual reality drawing um, program called Tilt Brush. Uh, so it's an AR tree that is still there. If you were to go there, it's still there, even though you can't see it, it's still there. If you had the right technology, it would still be there. So our principle here is that the digital and the physical can't be conceived as distinct from each other. 
There's nothing to be gained from supposing a practical or ontological separation of digital and physical. Nor would we endorse any kind of GIS style supposition that um, digital layers of information are kind of laid across or draped onto uh, the physical landscape. That would fall into the trap of assuming that worlds are built and represented before they're lived and experienced, uh, as Tim Ingold has notably regard, argued in respect of landscape. Ingold's insistence on a kind of non-dualistic understanding of landscape chimes with our own credo that we inhabit worlds that are already digital material. Whatever else it may be, landscape is definitely not something that is mediated or filtered by digital technologies. That is uh, our proposition uh, in terms of uh, landscape. And that brings me on to kind of thinking about landscape uh, in particular. And the types of the politics of landscape uh, that, that we think uh, are involved in the work that we're doing. Uh, and I'm going to talk through what, I, what we're calling two persistent myths of landscape. A myth of belonging and a myth of not belonging. And I think that those terms are going to recur in, in presentations uh, subsequently today. So... Landscape is a myth of not belonging. Now, I'm drawn here in the work on an essay by the art critic Robin Kelsey, uh, definition of landscape as a myth of not belonging. When Raymond Williams declared, all the way back uh, the year I was born, 1973, uh, when he declared in the country and the city that the very idea of landscape implies separation and observation, what he pinpointed was a particular sense of kind of aloofness and apartness as integral to landscape as an aesthetic, uh, mostly visual experience. This could seem paradoxical, given that visual landscape forms in particular are often associated with property, with ownership, and with control, uh, whether by privileged individuals and classes or by nation states. But landscape in this sense, as, as Williams points out, has a kind of Archimedean quality. It connotes control from a distance and a particular proprietorial imaginary that removes itself from direct contact with the land. In this way, the distances of landscape, it is argued, often involve an ethically problematic detachment, a distance which enables command and control. Uh, for Kelsey, Kelsey, this kind of distance defines a kind of uh, a fantasy, uh, as he calls it. In his reading, landscape is a technique for setting the world at a distance, but only that, so that we can deny our involvement, our belonging. Or rather, on the one hand, so that we can claim that we don't belong to the world, while on the other hand, acting as if it belongs to us, if it's our, prop it's our property. In this way, all landscape has a touch of fantasy, he argues. The fantasy of not belonging to the totality of life of a terrestrial expanse. The distances of landscape, in other words, allow us to pretend that we're kind of not earthlings, that we're not irrevocably bound to the fate of the worlds that we inhabit. Now, Kelsey's incisive diagnosis highlights how landscape imagery in particular sustains this fantasy of not belonging to the earth. He notes that romantic landscape art and literature, which on the face of it often seems to implore us to belong, to return, to reconnect, is in fact very much part of the discourse it apparently denies, insofar as it enshrines not belonging uh, in the kind of gesture of longing to belong. And he concludes with a pretty pithy summary uh, of why not belonging to landscape has its attractions. Belonging imposes limits, irritations, challenges and risks. Is it any wonder that we prefer fantasies of not taking part that we love landscape. Second myth in landscape as a myth of dwelling and belonging. If landscape, and especially visual or perspectival landscape, perpetuates a myth of not belonging, uh, we would argue that this is also the case, that a myth of belonging to landscape, of being at one with it, and by extension at one with yourself, uh, and at one with your neighbours, uh, sits at the heart obviously of many kind of extreme uh, ethnic or national ideologies of landscape. Um, so for example, Ken Olwig uh, in the audience today notes um, the development of this ideology in Germany where the land ceased to be an area defined by human law, it rather became the soil, Boden, which uh, determined the blood of the people dwelling on the land. There could be no doubt that the modern German conception of Landschaft was implicated in the promotion of blood and soil fascist ideology. And this is part of the process through which um, a kind of certain idea of landscape uh, that Ken has defined in terms of a, a territory of law and feeling became something really kind of quite different through the centuries. A very different articulation of this myth of belonging is supplied by Tim Ingalls, cultural anthropologist, 
uh, in the temporality of the landscape. The landscape, to recall the words of Merleau-Ponty, is not so much the object as the homeland of our thoughts. Now, I imagine that Ingold's work, or, or elements of it, um, will be well known to many people uh, here today. And, you know, I should say that this, this quote, obviously, is from 1993. And a comparatively early paper, and his thinking has evolved quite radically uh, in the kind of 25 years since then. Um, I was personally struck, however, by the appearance of the term homeland here, and by the equation implied of landscape and homeland. And that prompted me a few years ago to write a paper with this title, uh, A Landscape Cannot Be a Homeland. In terms of phenomenology, landscape almost inevitably becomes homeland, because phenomenology is premised from the outset uh, on a kind of mutual intercation of being and world. We're always already embedded in the world, in a mutuality that can't be disavowed. Um, the very term being in the world just declares this insoluble link, no being without world. Um, while world in this context can't be equated with kind of site or location uh, or with natural environment, when we look at Martin Heidegger's analyses and descriptions, especially in his later writings, they routinely evoke a self embedded in a landscape as exemplary of, of world. And so in this way, his, his whole philosophy can seem kind of landscaped in a, in a distinctive way, gathered and staged within a particular kind of tableau. So for this reason, I would argue that it remains difficult um, it's difficult to argue that phenomenology leads in any direction other than homewards, to a coincidence of self and body, and to a communion of self and landscape, as if there could ever be a people who belong to a landscape. In his book, Spectres of Mark, Jack Derrida coins uh, a neologism uh, for this type of term, ontopology, combining ontology being uh, and topology, a conflation of being, ontology, and location, topology. Ontopology proposes that there's such a thing as original inhabitants. <clears throat> this is, we think, or we would argue, a thinking that handcuffs people, culture, time, and land together. Um, and part of the kind of ethos underpinning our work is to try to kind of cut across uh, both this myth of belonging and the myth of not belonging. So here's a kind of set in this slide, um, just before I move to my final section, a couple of kind of propositions. The common line, we, we hope, it cuts across a myth of not belonging by encountering landscape as always everywhere embedded and dialogical. And equally, the common line cuts across a myth of belonging by dislocating. You can never actually reach it, as we discovered, by an ethics of digital experience moving always in the direction of difference and exposing claims to communion with landscape as contingent. That is a, our proposition. It remains a proposition at this stage. So, for the final few minutes then, uh, something of a change of gear and direction. And we're gonna move on to kind of uh, issues of citizenship in particular. The organizers uh, requested that we consider this and we're indebted to the organizers of this symposium for, for making us think about citizenship uh, because it was clear from the start for us that the common line was about identity and landscape and, and property and access. We hadn't thought about it in terms of citizenship specifically. Because of the kind of, the kind of digital nature of the kind of work that we're doing, because it's a, a digital project in many ways, as it's currently framed, we're going to focus here on digital citizenship. We say that citizenship is the ability to speak and act uh, on the things that matter to us, but at the same time, citizenship is, of course, shaped and governed by configurations of institutions uh, and material technologies. Um, what happens when you kind of add kind of like the, the digitality uh, into these conceptions? There is a kind of promise that's associated uh, with digital citizenship that is about possibilities for participation and engagement, an opportunity to have your say, a creative mode of production, a social necessity, a moral obligation uh, that, that kind of accompanies kind of claims to digital participation in citizenship activities. In reality, of course, digital platforms uh, in directly shape the kind of methods and results of participation. Participation can be coerced with relationships between governments, service providers, and citizens being structured, commercially exploited through surveillance, through protocols, through predictive analytics, through the collection and curation of data, as we know. Such technologies, as part of larger digital networks, 
um, bring the lives and experiences of distant others closer in ways that enable both power and power over. So digital, digital enrollment involves citizens being corralled within monopolized platforms, as we know, of surveillance, coercion, and capture. And we've been working through the common line, trying our damnedest not to use kind of standard software programs, not using Google Maps, for example, which makes the whole thing kind of quite challenging in some ways. So as I kind of moving towards a kind of conclusion with this, um, what we want to, what we've been led to kind of think about uh, partly through putting together this uh, paper for this talk today, but partly through the work that, that we're doing is, can we imagine through our work in the common line, through giving people the opportunity to kind of talk to each other about land, about access, about planting, through trying to kind of talk to people about digitality and physicality, can we imagine a disruptive digitality in tandem with the contingent energies of tree planting uh, and growth? And so, in terms of the landscape citizenship, the, the, the proposition of this particular symposium, we would kind of want to kind of argue towards a type of landscape citizenship that embraces and attempts to kind of turn around the coercive structures of digital participation for other means. That's, that's our kind of, this is nothing if not utopian, uh, the common line, and that is the kind of uh, the direction that we want to go to in terms of what we're thinking of digital citizenship. Last slide. Final slide. Just to quickly conclude. The common line, of course, is a straight line. Well, it's kind of straight. Calculated, a mathematical entity, decomposed further into constituent points. It's kind of ingled in reverse in many ways. How can it even be understood, therefore, as a lifeline in the sense that somebody like Tim Ingold advances? A living landscape of moving, flowing lines. Our wager, in tandem with the arguments we've advanced regarding digital citizenship, is that despite its apparent purity, precision, and straightness, the lived experience, the digital phenomenology of the common line, is all about disorientating interactions, in the sense that uh, Sarah Ahmed, who I'm quoting from here, writes of in her, in her masterpiece, uh, Queer Phenomenology. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.